like it's not so the podcast is called Muscle Intelligence I just because I couldn't find a better name but it's like ultimately paradigm challenging human beings who are doing great things and developing their own methodologies and their own unique thought processes and like I just I'm not about uh, bringing on people who are blowing smoke up into their ass right I don't we're going to challenge the thought process and like I've noticed that with your show yeah. <laughs> yep a lot of guys yeah. that challenge the because they're unique thinkers free thinkers right mm-hmm. I hate people who are like inside a box Here's the box, and we're over here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not, that's the way I raise my kids. That's why I like to talk to you about that too. It's like yeah. very fascinating, and proven that Prince as well. I'm just talking about like how do we do it different, like outside of this typical North American standardized model of like, hey, you have to do this, so you can achieve this, and you have to learn this way because this is the way everyone before you learn. I'm like, fuck that, fuck that. Like my kids aren't in school. Take them out. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so obviously we're already rolling. I want to introduce you guys to Ben Pukulski, pro bodybuilder. Uh, man, you, as a pro bodybuilder, you were in the Olympia. Yeah. Did you? What did you? Did you win? No. I, my best placing was second at the Arnold Classic. That's freaking amazing. Two thousand thirteen. And so, as I acknowledged, the various ways I was wrong with regard to bodybuilding, and uh, as a you know strong man and all these things, I'm into lifting, but never for actual muscle building or aesthetic or muscle muscle shaping, which is huge with bodybuilding. And, uh, and Ben is our guest expert who's gonna be talking not just about bodybuilding per se, but what he calls muscle intelligence. How about all the things I was wrong about with the muscle building space, right? So we all go through that phase of like, just lift heavy, just get bigger, yeah. just get stronger, this mindless training, right? Which is why the, the kind of counter of that is muscle intelligence. Most people are very mindless in the way they train. They go in and they just lift. Yeah. And so my approach is very much like, of all the things I've done wrong, here's all the biggest mistakes and here's how to not go through those pains. And most people don't acknowledge that they're doing something wrong until they're you know over 30 years old or often over 35, because in your 20, you get away with whatever, man. You just train hard, you eat more, you grow. But at some point, you all hit this, everyone hits this, this roadblock where, things start to hurt. Yeah. Like, I can't really do it anymore. Like, this isn't, I'm not responding the same way. Well, yeah, that's called age and wisdom to speak about. Um, so now, like, how do you take all those things that I learned of 20 years of professional bodybuilding and apply it to everyone, building a better body for themselves so they can feel better, look better, ultimately not have to, you know, live an old, decrepit life as they mm-hmm. age. So that's what most intelligence is. I like that. I like that a lot, especially since you're going to admit where you were wrong as a pro bodybuilder. I think that's that's even better. So uh, maybe we can start with the number one thing that uh, has evolved in your thought and your application process in bodybuilding. Well, maybe the biggest difference maker, and it's hard to conceptualize this, is just this idea of going into the gym angry and going in there to, yeah. to lift hard. And like, it's not about, like for, in my world, maybe in powerlifting and strongman, it's about going in there being angry, just lifting. But in my world, if you're trying to build a physique, the worst thing you can go in and do is lift angry and just just lift and just lift heavier and just lift harder. Yeah, it's literally the worst thing you can do because you're wow. developing, well, you're developing bad habits, right? Yeah. So it's, it's the idea of we don't read a book to read a book. We read a book to get something out of the book, right? Right. So I, I read a book a week. Do you, you know, you're read, yep. you read a book a week, whatever it is. But you don't read a book at the end of the week to say, hey, I read this book. What was in it? I don't remember. Like I read a book to actually remember all the information in the book. So with training, I'm not training to say that I train. I'm training to actually get a benefit out of it. So learning to train smart has to precede training hard. Just like reading, you have to learn how to read slowly before you can learn how to read fast. Right. Right. So how do I actually learn to get the most out of this training first in a very, very intelligent, methodical way, right. and then and only then does actually hard work and effort make more sense. Right. Our, like training harder and harder on the wrong things doesn't make a lot of sense, right? We're going to end up developing bad habits, injuries, movement patterns that are, that are wrong, uh, limitations in our mobility, limitations in our stability. You know, that's where injuries come from. So. How do we ultimately make somebody bulletproof and resistant to all these things while still developing a body and realizing that any time in life you have this, you have two opportunities to progress, right? You can progress with execution or you can progress with effort. And most people yeah. have so much opportunity that exists to progress with just improving their ability to challenge a muscle. So I, I frame muscle building differently, right? It's not about an external focus, it's an internal focus. Wow. And that goes very deep within your mind and your body, right? So an internal focus is when I'm trying to build a muscle, that exists inside my body, so I have to challenge a muscle inside my body. I'm not thinking about how much weight is in the bar, right. only in as much as it's this mechanism to, ch- to create an internal response. So I'm ultimately trying to create an internal focus. How much can I challenge a muscle? So my goal is not necessarily 
completion of an exercise or even completion of a repetition, it's how much can I then reverse that into how much am I actually challenging this one muscle. So it's ultimately isolation and challenge rather than uh, you know integration and, and, and lifting. Yeah. yeah, which is exactly where I've been. Yeah, yeah. Just okay. angry yeah. and lifting. There's value in that. Like I think mm -hmm. there, as a man, there's the idea that we're an animal. Like right. there's value in having like, I want to run through this wall and put my fucking head through that brick. Mm -hmm. There's value in that as a human. To, like, you know, I say, take your balls out of your purse. Like that, that there's value in doing that stuff. But as far as building your muscle, uh, it's just it needs to be preceded by intelligent first. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I've seen you refer to yourself as the bodybuilding yogi. Yeah. And what I when I hear that, I imagine this is a a tremendous amount of concentration, focus on every aspect of the movement that right. you're doing, down to the mechanics and the breathing and, and where your mindset is right and like, mindset what are you thinking about yeah so it, it's, it's all the integration of these things and I think it was you that made a post or someone made a post recently and, it, and it's something I preach a lot people think people watch me do yoga and they go why do you do yoga you're becoming soft you're becoming a hippie I'm like man if, you, if I did yoga during my bodybuilding career I would have been a better bodybuilder really for sure so imagine one like the superficial benefit being stability right like gosh you're massively improving your stability in all these obscure ranges of motion that's going to improve your ability to, to load muscle mm -hmm. but more important than that like getting uncomfortable in weird positions and be able to, to calm down your mind calm down that sy sympathetic nervous system get into a parasympathetic state and focus your bottleneck in everything in life whether it be muscle building or money or business or relationships just focus if you can't focus you're like a squirrel trying to catch a nut right you're all over the place so if i can learn how to focus and harness my energy into this one specific thing, I'm unstoppable. And that's ultimately what this, this yogic mentality toward muscle building looks like. It's like, how do you take all of these extraneous variables and just focus in on one thing and block everything else out? And, you know, I think muscle building should be meditative. Like, yeah. if you're in the gym and you're slinging you know, music playing, you're slinging weights and you're just hanging out, you're removing this opportunity to get better in, in becoming more mindful, becoming more present, right? So, like, in any relationship with your wife, with your kids, Success and failure comes in the amount of presence you can have in that relationship. Are you present or are you off on your phone effing around something else, right? So using training as your daily, almost meditative opportunity to implement discipline and develop character, like can I be focused and can I be present and can I actually give my all and am I disciplined enough to not quit and keep going and now I can start to, to learn my mind and learn how my body wants to break down and where I want to yeah. cheat and where my body just naturally instinctively wants to stop right. and go deeper and go deeper and go deeper and that's really where the true benefit starts to happen, right? Both mentally and physically. So maybe you could help me out a little bit. Uh, I've I've torn both biceps. Yep. Definitely. And I <laughs> no. Uh, actually, both of them were not during strongman. Not during. Isn't that the case? Yeah. Isn't that, yeah. isn't that the case? I injured, all my injuries came from doing something outside right. of the gym. Right. Go figure. Right. But I have a feeling that I tore my biceps because I never trained biceps in a concentrated way, in a focused way. It was always a movement that. Uh, it was always a muscle that was kind of just a part of something else. Right. And I think that caused limitations. And so what I've got now is both of them were torn, but this one, look at that. It rolled up. It rolled up, it was repaired, but it's not what it used to be and my mechanics are off. Yeah. And I've got to be really mindful about how I do a lot of the exercises on this right sure. side because this shoulder will start to feel weird. Sure, right. And I've, I've come really far but I still, when I train biceps, I don't think I'm using the kind of yogic concentration that's required to even to stimulate it properly. I sure. wonder if sure. you'd be willing to like Your show me. Considerations are very different because now you have to start. <laughs> look, you have to start looking at integrating the tertiary function of the biceps. So we have primary, secondary, tertiary action, right? Primary being flexion, secondary being supination, tertiary being flexion of the shoulder. Oh. So we want to look at okay, how do we actually incorporate flexion of the shoulder? big function of your bicep now is not even flexion of the, of the elbow. Your, your elbow flexion is going to kick on to do that. Now stabilizing that shoulder. Yeah. So we have to actually look at training that, that tertiary action of the shoulder, which is going to be just keeping the bicep in flexion and going through some shoulder flexion. So we're actually keeping that, really? that humeral head kind of down in the, in the, in the humeral joint. Yeah, so it's a completely different thought. Like Can that, we go try out some exercise yeah, sure. and just show me sure. how to do that? For sure. Amazing. I'm excited about that. Yeah, let's do it. So first thing we're going to discuss is why a muscle would tear, right? So typically, uh, external load is going to exceed tissue tolerance. So the, the amount of load we're lifting is exceeding the, ability, the muscle's ability to contract, pops. So well, why does that happen? Typically, a muscle's ability to contract will be governed by how much stimulus you put it in the past. So you've exceeded that, and also by, by limiting range of motion. So as we get bigger and stronger, a lot of our mass sits in the front of our body, right? So if you think of our spine, 
relative to everything that sits on, on, on the front of our body, we tend to get into these positions, mm. right? We tend to flex forward at the thoracic spine, roll forward at the shoulders. So what that does, it rolls our shoulders into internally rotated position. So we start to lack external rotation. So if you lack external rotation and you try to supinate the arm, so look, let's, let's say I have like a, most people tear their deadlift, their, their bicep on a deadlift, right? So if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to do a, a deadlift, I would need a bar going through my hand here. But if you notice, I can't get that much external rotation with my shoulders. So now my, my body goes, oh, I'm going to supinate my bicep into this position to get me there, or I'm going to tilt my body. So all these things are just positions of instability. So we put our body into positions of instability, and we're, now we're trying to literally supinate our arm with however much weight is in your hand and your bicep ends up being the thing that does it rather than being like a structurally oh, right. stable thing. Mm -hmm. so your bicep is this thing that's supinating, right? You see my bicep moving right there just by turning in that supination. So if I don't have external rotation at my shoulder, and I can't get into that massively, you see like this side, I can get to the point where I'm relatively flat. So oh, if yeah. I had a bar in my hand, it's relatively good. This side, I'm only at just about 45 degrees. So if I went into the underhand, over under deadlift with this hand, this bicep nine times out of 10 is gonna tear because it's now trying to supinate into that position with the bicep. So a lot of things, uh, a lot of times that's what causes injuries to happen. But in your case, it was just like your, your applied load exceeded tissue tolerance, right? So I yanked on it, tissue never done that before, we're getting a little older, bang, things happen, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, as far as getting it stronger, now we're looking at stabilizing structurally that shoulder to allow you to prevent injuries long term. So if that bicep plays this tertiary action of keeping that, that humerus, so the bone of your arm, in the socket. So if you think about that shoulder, right, yeah. it, there's no there's no uh, structural stability. It's all it's all uh, muscles, right? Mm -hmm. So that bicep plays a big role in the anterior stability. That's where I was having the problem. Yeah. So training that function looks like this. So if we so if we look at function, if I just do this, that long head of the bicep is contracting. So if I push down, obviously my tricep going to contract. So by going up, the long head of the bicep has to contract. So now I curl up and then I finish the function with a little bit of just shoulder flexion. So I get the full elbow flexion, and I finish with just a little bit of shoulder flexion, right? And I can manipulate how much resistance I have. Let's try that, Elliot. So let's go here, I want you to sit, now, now the cable's straight. I want you to go just above straight, so now the shoulder and the bicep is actually loaded in that position. And then I want to curl, and then finish. So we're just trying to train that tertiary action of the bicep. You should get a really hard contraction of the bicep, and um, ultimately, you're, you're training that shoulder flexion function. So here, you curl all the way into elbow flexion. Good. Now just keep going a little further. There you go. That's it. Yeah. So, oh. yeah. So if you um, sit there, bring the arm up just a little higher. Good. Go from there. Good. So what we don't want to do, you keep going. You're doing great. We don't okay. want to have the elbow go too high because then we're going to lose tension. Just enough so you like feel the tension. Rather than thinking about the movement, I want you to feel where the tension is, right? Okay. So keep that elbow high as you uh, get now contract, pull with that, contract hard, contract hard, contract hard. Hold that tension as hard as you can. Now use that tension to pull you into a little bit of shoulder flexion. Right? So rather than thinking about the movement, we're thinking about the muscle. Internal focus. Squeeze hard, squeeze hard, squeeze hard, squeeze hard. Squeeze hard. Now use that flexion to come up into shoulder. Yeah, there you okay. go. So what kind of tempo? Is this a good tempo? And I don't like to prescribe tempo to most people. I like okay. to prescribe control. So can you tell me at every inch of that rip you're contracting that muscle? Right? I don't, I'm not. Right. So that's that's focus. So now you need to put your mind into, away from all those things you're thinking about out there and put it there. So it's almost meditative, right? Nine now. times out of ten, you see me with my eyes closed, right? So I'm trying to eliminate all the external variables. And I'm trying to say, okay, like how can I just go inside there? Yeah, exactly. Even on the eccentric, you see what you did there? Like yeah. you see that? Yeah. So now you're accelerating it with this. Now using contract harder, contract harder, contract harder. Now use the bicep to decelerate it on the way down. Right. Wow. So, yeah, big difference. So that's training your bicep in its fully shortened position. So that's going to strengthen the integrity of the shoulder joint. But we also want to challenge your bicep in its fully lengthened position, which is shoulder extension and pronation. So this would be the kind of second action we want to challenge. Because the reason a bicep would tear, if it's never been in this fully lengthened position, you finally, it's like the idea of a pec, right? When does a pec tear? Well, either the shoulder instability, or you go to a position where you've never been before, right? Mm. So people can bench press 500 pounds here, but if they go here, pec tears. Mm. It's never been there, so it becomes so weak, those muscles never go to that lengthened position. So we want to train a bicep at its lengthened position. So now, as you notice, the angle of that cable is pulling me directly back. So as soon as I start curling, that bicep's got tension. Right, so you can do this with dumbbell, you can do this with cable, but 
That's the idea. So I'm in shoulder extension. I'm really stabilized through my lat pulling down. And the only thing that moves is that elbow joint, right? Everything else is completely locked in stone. That's another big problem people have is they really overuse their body. Thinking about your body's always trying to make things easy. So your body's like, what do I have that can put me into a position to make this thing easy? So I'm right. trying to move weight rather than challenge muscle. Right. So in the powerlifting world, that makes sense. I'm trying to use leverage. I'm trying to use every possible advantage I can. Yeah. In this, we're trying to eliminate that and just isolate, right? Because we want that muscle we're trying to train to do the work. So give that a spin. I, I think I remember reading in one of your eBooks that you would even like flex the bicep. The tricep, I mean yeah. the tricep. Yep. So Here. that just tells me that bicep's gonna be fully lengthened. So stand up real tall, engage down on your on your lat. So we stabilize that shoulder with the lat, contract that tricep so you know it's fully lengthened. Now, before you move, I want you to squeeze the bicep as hard as you can and use that contraction to move through that range. So it's contraction-based training rather than movement-based training. And then to here? Right, as far as you can, nothing moves. Now keep, you keep that bicep contracted on the eccentric all the way down. Good. So we're trying to create this internal challenge, right? So you know, one thing you said when we, when we chatted was like, hey, you're used to training with light weights. I'm like, right. no, <laughs> it's as heavy as you possibly can with proper form. Are you actually using the muscle? Right. right. So the objective is as heavy as you possibly can, never light. Understood. But you'll notice that when you do it like that, things will fatigue faster. You don't need faster. much weight. Well, things will fatigue faster. Eventually yeah. you can get the weight. Like eventually the goal is I want to get, I want to use more and more weight. So now as, as you see, you start to get tired, your, your arm wants to come forward. So you try right. to mechanically uh, cheat a little bit. So keep that shoulder and elbow back. Good. Use that lat to really keep that whole scapula down. There you go. So now this would be the type of thing that may have prevented that type of injury. I think you're right. Yeah, just letting that bicep know, like, hey, you have to be strong in this length and position. Yeah. Under control, right? When you're doing it ballistically, that's when you'll tear yourself in the chip. Wow, yeah, you really gotta focus. Take your so, time. Yeah, the simplest way to think about it, every, every muscle you train, I think about it in three lengths. So fully shortened, fully lengthened, and then somewhere in the middle. So everyone usually just trains at one, everyone trains in the middle, right? Because mm -hmm. so, I'm strong here, but nobody ever goes here where they're weak and here where they're weak, right? Mm -hmm. So always thinking about- Yeah, never, I've never done anything like no. this before. People, people bench press, like everybody will do a bench press, they'll even do some flies, but whoever goes to this position where the pec is actually fully lengthened, like nobody, so this extra rotation, right? And then how about fully shortened, like whoever trains here, like some people by accident, but never intentionally, right? So thinking about every muscle in threes, lengthened, mid, shortened. And are you challenging the muscle through all of those aspects of the range? And if you are, the likelihood of injury goes down. It's not eliminated. When you train like this, I would say injury is eliminated. But uh, you know, most people end up going faster or cheating using weights that are outside of their ability to control. Mm -hmm. So, but when you train those three aspects of the range, injury is almost a, a, like inevitably can't really can't really happen because mm -hmm. you have so much control in those muscles just used to being challenged in those ranges. Being present. You even close your eyes. You mentioned. 90% of the time. Wow. Like obviously I'm squatting or something, my eyes are open because I have to kind of pay attention. But yeah. if it's anything that, that's in a fixed position where I know I'm safe, I'm, I'm just inside, man. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, whenever, whenever possible, I'm so meditative, literally thinking about both ends of this muscle. So the, the, the metaphor, the analogy I always give is like, if a muscle has two ends and I have you know one end in each hand, imagine it's an elastic band. If I give you one in the elastic band and I say create tension and, and you mm -hmm. pull it and I go at the same and I move with you. So if you pull that band right. and I moved with you, how much change in length in the bed? None, right? So there's yeah. no tension being created. In order for you to create tension, I have to generate absolute stability here for you to pull that one. Uh, now there's some stretch in the bed. Mm -hmm. Now there's some tension being generated, right? Well, it's the same in muscles. So I need to be so focused on if I'm training this, I need this thing to not move. So I need this so anchored. So I was saying like stabilize yeah. that lat, right? So like stabilizing that lat it needs to be so stable so that this thing can actually generate maximum force. Most people are doing bicep curls like this. Yeah, and everything's right, so, moving. Yeah, so they're not actually generating tension in the bicep. They're generating movement, mm -hmm. they're, they're overcoming inertia, generating momentum, and they're actually generating tension in the muscle, which is ultimately the signal for growth. So what are some of the uh, other things you were wrong about? Yeah, everything, man. Well, I think as, as, a, as a kid, so I started this at 15 or 16, and as a kid, there, there has to be some type of egocentric drive, right? Yeah. There has to be some drive to like, I want to be strong, I want to be big. Oh yeah. So the idea of lifting heavy weights makes sense. To tell a kid like, hey man, you got to slow down, you got to chill out, it's <laughs> very hard, right? Yeah. He's like, F you, I know better, which I, which I literally deal with every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I get it, but at some point you realize like, oh, like, that guy's right. If I had actually done that from the beginning, I would have been able to grow so much faster, so much better, so much more consistently without injuries. 
So but I think it, there has to be some type of transcendence of ego for you to actually realize that. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say like before 30 you train with your balls, after 30 you train with your brains. Yeah. And it's, it's a bit obscure, but like that's just the way, like most people before 30, just, just train hard and they grow up. Doesn't mean it's right, doesn't mean it's the best way to do it, but you do it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just kind of like work. Like when we're young, we just work hard. Like we're just gonna work harder than everybody right? in, in business. And then eventually you realize like, well, it's kind of this 80-20 principle. Like if I yeah. do this 20% of things, I'm gonna get 80% 80 of the results. Like, okay, well, let's do that. That's working smart first, right? Rather than doing everything, we're gonna delegate a few things in business and we just focus on what we're great at. Yeah. That's that's the same in training, man. Like you learn these few basic smart principles, right. that's what you need to get good at. And most people can get uh, make mistakes by trying to do too much. And I think there's, there's too many things that go into fitness. And fitness is so, so simple if you uh, are wise enough to see it. Yeah. So, uh, when you're training a muscle, how many different exercises do you do? As few as possible. As few as possible, as okay. As possible. So, and, and the answer is, the ones that you're really, really good at. Here, so here's why. So, if you want to play basketball, and you want to go play in a game, but you don't know how to dribble, you can't play in a game. First, you got to learn the skill, right? And people neglect the fact that exercise, every single one of these things you do is a skill. Yeah. And if you actually want to be able to perform output at that skill, like in deadlifting and squatting, you have to be good at the skill of deadlifting, squatting, or bicep curls, right? So you have to practice that skill. And once you've accomplished the ability to execute that skill with unconscious competence, meaning I don't think about it, my body says how to do it. Now, I can actually start to focus on effort. So I suggest everybody spend uh, more time thinking about less exercises and master the skill. See, how many people do you see in a gym that actually know what they're doing in exercises? Mm -hmm. Like so few, right? So most people are doing five or six or seven exercises yeah. just to get a little bit of a stimulus when they suck at all of them. Like <laughs> do one or two and actually become really, really, really good at those. Like become an expert at those exercises. Then we'll add a third one in, right? So if I'm really good at two, I know I can get a lot of work into this two. And people are gonna say, oh, what about extra muscle confusion? And, and, right. and, and but what? Muscle confusion comes in a form of a novel stimulus, which means I can train in four reps today, six reps tomorrow, eight reps the day after, 10 reps, and then 15 reps. So those are all a novel stimulus. So I can manipulate time, the amount of time during the set. I can manipulate the time between the sets. I can manipulate all these different variables without having to change the exercise. That's amazing, yeah. Right, so get really, really good at an exercise and realize like that's the opportunity to get better. So when I prescribe workouts to people, the only reason I prescribe any more than two exercises is because people's expectations are such that you're supposed to do more. It should be one, two, max three exercises depending how much of an expert you are. When you're doing something with that type of concentration, yeah. how many reps is best? Again, it's, it's always variable, right? It it's, doesn't it's, matter. It's gonna be, well, it does matter, but it's gonna be like six, or four, or eight, or 12, but all, noticing that all of those have the potential to create a different internal stimulus, right? So I'm trying to get a neurological stimulus, so I want my nervous system to adapt and recruit more muscles at once. I want the weight to be heavy. If I want a muscle building stimulus, I need the weight to be heavy, but still be able to have a little bit more time with this tension, right? Because I need to have a bit of a metabolic accumulation of metabolites and lactate and, and hydrogen mm. and stuff. And then, so that, that's a mid-range stimulus. And if I want to have more of a metabolic stimulus, so I'm actually burning more calories, it's just time. It's like, you know, this six rep versus 12 rep versus 20 rep thing is just a manipulation of time. Yeah. So our objective is maximum tension over variable time. So how much time can you subject this muscle to? Uh, to elicit a different internal response. So it doesn't matter how much weight is in the bar right. if I'm not eliciting the internal response, right? Yeah. So the internal response is what? Well, I need the muscle I need the muscle to grow, or I need the nervous system to adapt and get more efficient at contracting, or I need to create a, a calorie deficit, or you know, like all those different potential internal stimuli, right? So that's what I'm after when I'm training, man. It's not this external goal of I need to lift more weight. Maybe it is if that's your goal, but in mm -hmm. muscle building, it's not. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, there's nobody talking about this stuff, right? Which is why, like, this, this type of training has really caught on in this really uh, you know, niche, educated, intelligent demographic because people are like, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. It just makes so much sense. When you hear it, you're like, fuck, like, it, just, it just makes sense. Like, yep. You can't refute it. It's not like that's his way and this is my way. It's like, it's fucking logic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so I have a question about breathing. Uh, you yeah, know, breathing's I, my jam, man. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Because I made a big mistake where when I was in strongman and yeah. powerlifting, Everything was Valsalva, right. you know. <laughs> Which makes sense for And everything you, right? I did was explosive, but right. I found that as I started moving towards more bodybuilding and taking my time with sure. things, that uh, that was no longer really helpful. And right. in fact, I discovered that I had a hypertrophied solar plexus. 
and it was almost becoming annoying. I couldn't even train my abs because of freaking solar plexus. Right. I wants to do everything. So how do you go about that? I think everybody does that. So if you're doing one to three repetitions, it makes sense to do a Velsana, right? Because you're trying to create as much intra-abdominal pressure as possible. So you're ultimately creating a column here that doesn't bend. Right. For a single rep, that makes a lot of sense. And hypertrophy, when you're doing extended amounts of time, makes absolutely no sense. So the trick then is developing the skill of being able to stand there in absolute tension of your, you know, so your trunk is unbendable while still breathing in a, in a calm way. Yeah. So, when you, and you understand this, but your listeners may not, this, this balance of the autonomic nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a sympathetic branch and a parasympathetic branch. Sympathetic being fight or flight, and parasympathetic being rest and digest. And we all, we live in a society of being very stress dominant. We're always yeah. over in the sympathetic state. And the, the, the breath of inhalation is the breath of the sympathetic nervous system. So we're gonna increase sympathetic drives. So we go, that increases sympathetic drive. Whereas, so learning that is a, is a superpower in training, right? If right before a set, I'm like, now my nervous system just goes bang, it gets fired up, whatever I go. As soon as I'm done a set, now all of a sudden I can bring my nervous system back down, so I'm not constantly burning on, burning high heat, right? So learning how to control these things is very beneficial. So when I'm thinking about when I'm training, if I'm if I'm going for like a max out set, I'm trying to get my nervous system as high as possible. So I'm going with that high high breath rate. But as soon as I'm done that set, I'm down to the parasympathetic. So I'm literally sitting down with my eyes closed and I'm almost going to a meditative breath because I want to come out, realize if I go, <gasps> my, 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 I saw a line in the corner over there, I'm trying to run away from the line. Your, your heart rate goes up, your brain releases adrenaline, catecholamines, you start running, right? Yeah. So you don't want to be in that state for a long period of time. So you may be good to be in that state when you're trying to like lift a 600, 800 yeah. pound squat, but not for two and a half hours. Right, gym, that's right? what I used to do. Totally. I was addicted so to I. being like that. So I, <laughs> and then you come out and you go, I don't know why I need coffee to wake up in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, what's the welded, right? Yeah. Uh, but learning that, like, hey, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to get here with my nervous system, but I also want to be able to get here. So most people live in this world where they have these very little kind of oscillations of the nervous system. So they never get really high. They never get, like, really get really low. So they don't sleep really well. They have a hard time getting up in the morning. They don't have the energy. They don't have this abundance of energy that we should have. And they also can't, like, sleep. So it should be the opposite, right? We should have an abundance of energy, this excess of energy, and then we should be able to get really, really calm and relaxed and meditative and sleep and actually have good deep sleep. But so this is like the fluctuation of the, the autonomic nervous system, which is indi indicated in heart rate variability, right? Mm -hmm. So you've heard of heart rate variability, most people have, at least at this point, and it's the, it's the next frontier of performance, right? Really? Oh, dude, in the next five years, like every pro athlete is going to be measuring and modulating their autonomic nervous system through tracking heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So if my objective as an athlete is to be able to perform at a really high level, well, I need the ability to turn on my sympathetic nervous system and get it really, really high immediately. And I also need to be able to stop what I'm doing, you know, whether I'm playing basketball or hockey or baseball, I need to be able to come down and right, calm myself down as immediately as possible. Mm -hmm. So the control of that system is integral. It's key. Is that something that you want to be mindful of all day long or just in the gym? Well. Ideal scenario is you want to be in 22 hours of parasympathetic. I would say, huh. right? Like okay. two hours of, of sympathetic in the gym, 22 hours of your parasympathetic. So, and, and, and if you look at why that is, parasympathetic is the breath of, of rest and digest. So if we're eating, our food's being digested. It's also an anabolic state. So we want our body to be recovering and, and repairing itself all the time. Um, that's just, you know, it's, it's a calm place where you can actually now get into an alpha brain wave rather than being in this beta, like always on high alert. Um, so that's the difference here between sympathetic, which is going to kick you into this, this stress response and get you out of the ability to think, versus being right. parasympathetic, where it's like now I can be meditative, now I can be concentrated, focused, and, and calculated in my approach to life, so responsive rather than reactive, right? So sorry, we're giving them a lot of like, a lot to think about, but... No, it's, just, it's good it, stuff. Yeah, this is all just like the integration of high-level performance. Yeah. We, you know, we don't want to be an average person. We want to be a high-level performer in all we do, right? Business and home and sex life. And like, I want, I want to be really good at all these things. Yeah. And, and so all of that requires the ability to control your mind. So how do you control your mind? Well, you control your mind with your breath. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like the breath is the, the lever gateway, point man. for everything. Interesting stat is uh, a girl was on my podcast, Micra Hamilton, she's amazing, I'll introduce you. Um, so in current society, in I think it was 2018, the average number of breaths per minute, so our respiration rate is somewhere between 17 and 19 breaths per minute. Sounds about right, I see people that said, yeah, that sounds about what I would do. Well, if you think back 100 years ago to 1920, the average uh, respiration rate was between five and seven. <laughs> So really? It's tripled in it, 100 in years. In the 1920s. Yep. So it's tripled. Just because of the way they were living. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, no stress, no cars, no uh, EMF, no blue lights. 
Like it's completely different. So all these things, like our technology, uh, it's destroying our health. Ah. Yeah. So it's a blessing and a curse, right? It's amazing it is, to have, right? because like information, you know, I was telling my wife about homeschooling, like information, learning is never going to be the kid's problem. It's never going to be the ability to, to gather information. It's going to be keeping the curiosity to get to get, want to go out and gather the information, right? Because if I have a question about something, I put it in Google, I have the answer. Information is yeah. at my fingertips. Right. So learning is never going to be the problem, but it's keeping the desire to learn. And that's what mm -hmm. we have to teach in schools. Is like, how do you harness curiosity and a passion for accumulating knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. and anything, right? So um, I think that's really the thing, is we have this blessing of like unlimited information, mm -hmm. but we lose the, the desire to accumulate it because it's easy. Mm -hmm. Or to apply it. It seems yeah. like everybody knows everything, right. but nobody right. knows how to use it. Right. Yeah. So what are some of the best biofeedback? Like, I think there's some technology that helps us know our heart rate variability. Yeah, I use an aura ring. So, uh, oh. yeah, it's on your finger. I don't have one now. Because um, on your finger, it actually has more accurate uh, heart rate yeah. measures. Um, so a wrist, uh, like a, I also have a Phoenix by Garmin, so I compare them. It's a little bit different. But I just prefer the aura, aura ring because one, it's not as obtrusive. It's kind of not yeah, my way. Yeah, I've seen those. They're amazing, man. Amazing. So it measures my sleep, measures my respiration rate, so my number of breaths per minute. Uh, it measures my heart rate, so it's, it's an amazing tool, and it's not in the way. It kind of just looks like a second wedding ring, right? So. And does it let you know how many hours you've been in parasympathetic versus sympathetic? No. So it'll let you know your heart rate variability. So okay. that will tell you like where is my heart rate variability relative to what my kind of baseline is. So right. The higher your heart rate variability, the better. Low heart variability. The more means, it changes, the right, better. Right. So the low heart variability means I have this very slight oscillation, and my nervous system is non-responsive. So it's not getting the peaks, it's not getting the recovery. Right. So it's just kind of sitting in the middle. Which yeah. is most people. Yeah, that's why I'm giggling. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to get the ability, like I want to be able to get primal and really, really get fired up. Right. But then when I'm done, I need to be able to get into I need to be a, a yogi, right? I need to be a, to be a monk. Yeah. That's the beauty of, of what you know this should be, what muscle building and bodybuilding should be. Mm -hmm. Like this really primal warrior warrior spirit with the ability in the heart of a yogi. So maybe there's a brand in there somewhere, right? Yeah, the, I like the that. Warrior Yogi or something, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, so that, that's ultimately what it should be. So what are some tools or techniques that you use to help bring you into a parasympathetic state or to well, bring that variability uh, I'll tell you, and this down? Is, this is applies to, I talk about my kids a lot because they're kind of my, they're my greatest, you know, greatest aspect of my life. But mm -hmm. what I do for the kids is every morning when I'm home with them, which I was now homeschooling, we'll sit down for in the morning, I'll do five to 10 breaths. So I just teach them this, just a mindful breath. So it's just extended breath, you know, relax it. They don't contract and relax in their muscles. So they now just have the ability to do an extended breath under control and be mindful. Five breaths. And now if they're ever stressed, if they're having a bad moment, if they're acting out, or if they're doing something that's maybe inappropriate, instead of having to yell at them, I'm just like, hey, five breaths. Take a few breaths. Yeah, so that's it. And like how much, how much wisdom is there in that for an adult? Like, hey man, it's not just like, it's got to be like how long and extended can I make my exhalation? Because that knowing that's the breath of the parasympathetic nervous system, I really want to keep a controlled breath in into my diaphragm, and then exhaling it out again, contracting the diaphragm, bringing the diaphragm up as the air exhales out. That's the easiest one, man. It's always there, right? Mm -hmm. It's always there to be able to take kind of conscious inventory of what does my body feel like? Am I am I up here intense? Am I clenching my jaw? Right. Or am I just like completely? Uh, present and relaxed in my body. You know, when I feel stress or if I feel anxiety, taking inventory of that and going, thank you for this awareness, taking a breath and letting it go, man. It's just emotion, it's just it's just energy that's bound up. Let's move it, just move it. And that's, there's so much with it. And, and don't think you can apply it in the moment if you've never done it outside of the moment, right? When you're stressed. You go practice. You, yeah, you gotta go practice, man. You have to be able to, that's why I do it in the morning with the kids, because that way when, when they need it, it's right there. Whereas most people, they don't ever practice this stuff until they become stressed and they go, oh, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I was stressed, it didn't help. You don't actually know how to do it. Like you gotta spend that 10 minutes every morning, it's life changing. So yeah. I, I think that's, you know, I recommend to everybody is an app called Waking Up by Sam Harris. Are you familiar with Sam Harris? Uh, no, I'm not. Brilliant, man. So Sam Harris got a podcast. Um, he's got an app called Waking Up, and it's, it's the most transformative. We give it to everybody. It's 50 days of 10 minutes every day. And the reason I think it's great is because I've never met, I've done meditation for a long time. I've never met anybody who does as good a job kind of describing what you need to be doing to get into this presence uh, conscious state, right? To be present in the moment, to be mindful, and actually use consciousness to your advantage in life. So we're talking a lot about like outside of the gym, and yeah. you know, that's the majority of the time that we're, you know, we're alive, we're outside of the gym. How do you go about breathing and executing your exercises that maybe are 
a bit more parasympathetic, but at the same time building muscle. Is that possible? Can you do a bodybuilding exercise, but how are you mindful of your breath? How are you stabilizing sure. and not yeah. Practice. tensing? Practice. So not every one of your sets in the gym is 100% effort, right? So there should be some warm-up sets. There should be some physical rehearsal sets, which means like I'm, I know that I'm going to squat. I want to rehearse what that looks like. So uh, those ones don't need to be sympathetic, right? They need to be as mindful and parasympathetic as possible. So that's when I'm applying this idea of like, how do I, you know, you talk about breathing into your balls. That's just the same thing, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> breathe, you know, like breathe down into your stomach, pull that parasympathetic, or sorry, pull that, that uh, pelvic floor up into your belly and just stabilize that and, and like pulling the energy from the ground through your body, yeah. right? So at least you're pulling your balls into your stomach. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're creating stability of this, you know, that you kind of have three hubs of stability, the pelvis, the spine, and the shoulders, uh, the scapula. So creating massive stability there while I'm still able to be calm and talking to you and relax and, and be able to contract and relax those things at will. And it's not just fluttery contractions. It's like, how do we get an aggressive really contraction? Really hard contraction. Yeah, and then be able to relax it, man, right? So, so again, you pull up on the pelvic floor with yeah. a lot of, like even if you're doing biceps here, it's a matter of stabilizing. Of time. Oh, wow. Yeah, 100% of the time. Dude, deadlifts. That so just takes the concentration level up another well, 100. Well, in the beginning, it does, right? <laughs> yeah. Like anything that's new is challenging. Mm -hmm. Right, but the more you, the better you get at it. Like, I can just do it sitting there. I can do it for long periods of time. So mm -hmm. it was one of the greatest gifts when I was bodybuilding. When I discovered this toward the end of my career, because it gave me control of my abdominal wall. And the big problem in bodybuilding, you see these guts because it's. Not, I don't think it's because of extension because of drugs that everybody thinks. I think it's this problem that nobody pays attention to their stomach. Right. Maybe drugs are a consideration, but like when you have to eat to be 260, 280, 300 pounds, you get it. It's a lot of food. So your stomach's always. A, and then you, you lose uh, conscious control of the abdomen of the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I learned to control that again, my waist went, I literally lost four inches in my, in my waist in the last year, but I just paid attention to my pelvic floor. People go, what did you do? I paid attention. Mm -hmm. That was literally my response. Mm -hmm. What did you do? I paid attention. And if you can do that, and all of a sudden you have the ability to control your waist in all these positions and be able to do it with relative ease, because I've practiced so much, it's easy, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. I first learned about that exercise from Paul Check. Yeah. And so it was pelvic stabilizing exercises, lower abdominal or transverse abdominis. Yeah. Yep. But then I also heard about it from Montak Chia. Do, do you know who that is? No. He was on a, he wrote a book called The Multi Orgasmic Male. Okay. Yeah. And it's just like same so thing, by right? training that muscle, yeah. you actually can control your ejaculation. Right. Yeah, so yeah, it's totally. twofold there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally, absolutely. Yeah, very cool. So I, I, I would love to actually. Talk maybe outside the gym for a moment, because I love the fact that you're your dad and you're homeschooling. What made you decide to homeschool, and what's that? What's that like? Uh, it was multifaceted, right? So um, I travel a lot um, by choice, and I'm like, well, if I'm going to go on the road for a few weeks at a time, I'd love to be able to bring my kids, and they're, you know, they're young. So I was like, why not? Mm -hmm. Why can't I? I can afford to. My, you know, the, the job allows me to. Uh, my wife was willing to, to contribute and be part of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so that was a big part of it. We had a decision and we made that decision. And I'm not very, um, not a very, very big fan of the current schooling system. Sure. Right? The idea of you put 30 kids or however many into a classroom and see you all need to learn the same thing. All very different. You know, the best example with my kids, my, my son is a very auditory and visual learner. You give him something, he gets it. Like he just gets it right away. My daughter simply doesn't, so she's very kinesthetic, kinetic. So we have to actually physically do things with her, and then she gets. She's she's a whiz. She's she's a gymnast. She's the athlete. Film. She's going to be nice. a pro athlete. Where my son is a, is, a, is a brain. Yeah. So, but most people, most parents would kind of be like, "Hey, the son's supposed to." And be how the old athlete. are they? Five and seven. Mm -hmm. Five, seven, twelve. Um, so, but like my daughter, to teach her stuff like math and science, she says, "Look, it takes longer." Writing it takes longer, but as soon as she can physically do something, she gets it. So how can you put those two students in the same classroom and say, hey guys, you can go in the same curriculum? Yeah, right. You know, she would be stressed and hate school and, and, and be, be worried about it, whereas my son would be like, the board. He was in first grade and he was doing fourth grade math. He's reading yep. at fifth grade level. And we're like, how can we put this kid in, in a class with a bunch of kids? And he goes there, he's like, dad, we're doing the shit I did when I was in kindergarten. And I was like, okay, man, we'll, we'll pull you out and just let you go at your own pace. I give him books, I'm like here. Kid, he reads about a book a week, he's reading at fifth grade level, and like, hey man, what you want to learn, you learn. Just kind of let them go at their own pace, and you realize they have such inquisitive questions if you don't take that out of them. Right. Like, you know, like you go into school, you're like, hey, you're not allowed to talk about that. Don't talk about this right now, that's not what we're doing right now. Well, right. I let them guide the curriculum. Uh -huh. like, I literally go home and I'm like, hey guys, what do you want to learn about today? Mm -hmm. I say the most obscure things. Like, I want to learn about light bulbs. I want to learn about rocks. I'm like, yeah. so where does that go, right? Light bulbs, electricity, you know, Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin, and then you're like, okay rocks where we're learning about minerals and where they come from and stars and the galaxy and you like you just take them down this path and you you, you, you kind of um, facilitate this this curious journey of like hey i'm looking at a rock why does that come from outer space dad like 
you mean that comes from outer space? Well, yeah, all of our minerals came from outer space. Right. You know, they came from a rock that exploded, and they're like, what? And their brains are just like, where do I get more information? You know, and that, that's what learning should be in my eyes, is like taking this really simple principle and letting them look layers deep and just get like generate curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than going, there's a textbook, you need to do it by Friday. I'm like, fuck. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. I hated school. And then they get the, uh, the, the sympathetic overload. Yeah, <laughs> And yeah, they're stressed I, out. Yeah, exactly. I can't <laughs> sleep at night. I'm anxious. Like, I, you know, yeah, yeah, totally, man. And they don't fit it in their class because they're not learning, and there's kids making fun of them because they're, they're different. Like, get it, man. Like, get it. I just think it's it's absolutely ridiculous, and uh, I support anybody who's homeschooling. Like, we started that that dad's group, and yep. I think it's a brilliant idea just to give dads uh, an opportunity to think differently mm -hmm. and realize it's okay to, to not fit in with the the normal American or Canadian. Oh, or it's North better. I oh, did not fit well, in. <laughs> I get, well, yeah, we say that, but uh -huh. like. Again, that, again, that's just being uh, you know, subjective, right? Like, mm -hmm. like you know, just choose your path. And we're there to support you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you spend the first half of the day. I know you get, you came here this morning, but yeah. you were spending the morning with your kids as often as I can. So typically two to three days a week. I'm I'm schooling from nine to noon. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, my wife will school nine to noon on uh, you know, the days that I'm not there, and I'll be there. It's not me, is it? No, yeah. oh, it is. It's all right. What a shame. Um, so yeah, my wife will school, school, school 9 to noon, and there's a good place. So wake up in the morning at 7.30, keep them on schedule as much as possible, go for a walk, which is 45 minutes to an hour. Again, appreciate the sun, appreciate what's around us, just kind of point out things to them so they get their, their curiosity flowing, have some breakfast, 8.30 to 9, 9 to noon, we're, 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 we don't even call it school, we call it learning. So you learn about whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like, you know, we do a bit of a gratitude uh, practice. Today we did a gratitude prayer for, you know, just filled their heart and send it out to one person in, yep. in, the, in, in the world. Uh, and then get into doing whatever they wanted to learn about. So today we did some math because my son likes math. And I'm like, okay, like that's your choice. And yeah. Last week we were doing, uh, like I said, electricity and light bulbs. I took him to Niagara Falls and like, hey, let's look at this and let's let's now we 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 had created a generator. So like, hey, you know, this is a turbine spin turbine spins generates electricity in the generator. Generator goes down these tubes. So we literally created one and allowed him to, to be part of the learning process rather yeah. than just like sitting at a desk and being like, bored. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And when you travel, do you bring, do you ever bring them with you? All the time. Yeah, we spent a month in Australia in January. Wow. We spent two months in Canada this month. We're going to spend a month in Iceland and the UK in uh, June, uh, September or October in Italy for three weeks. So just kind of let them see the world, man. And I think, yeah. I think there's value in that, in that yep. like the fear becomes removed of, of the unknown, right? Right. So if you think about like I was just in Dubai, taking them. So we're going to go there in September for ten days. Take Amazing. them over there, like it's just a different culture. They're gonna get yeah. to ride a camel, they're gonna get to see the desert, they're gonna get to eat different types of foods, so you're gonna meet different types of people who dress differently. And they're, you know, now if, if you wait till they're 20 and you expose them to that, now it's so different, you get fear. You're like, what are these people? These people aren't part of my tribe. Mm -hmm. But now if you let them see it at five, seven, and 12, and all of a sudden that's just, that's just part of the tribe. The worldview becomes bigger, so the fear gets removed, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful opportunity to teach kids because. Why do, why do we fear those things? Because fear the unknown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think so like the more we can kind of just go there. I don't ever want to go for like five days. Like I want to go for three weeks or a month because yeah. like submerse ourselves in the culture, uh, expose yourself to more, meet more people, be uncomfortable, be afraid, and realize there's, there's nothing at the end of that fear, right? Mm -hmm. Except for growth. Yeah. Well, this is great because we're involved in, I think anybody who lives in, is involved in personal development. Yeah. And if you have children, it's personally developing your children. Yeah. And so I think it all fits. Before we wrap up, man, what is one more mistake that you've made as a bodybuilder or something that you wish you knew earlier on? Um, again, this is super controversial, especially right now. Uh, the idea of like eating more is results in growth. Right? right. So if you eat a banana and I eat a banana, both of us on the outside, we see a banana. Inside yeah. of our body could have completely different responses. Ah. So why? Well, if you're in a stress state, and your brain's worrying about money and, and taxes and relationships and whatever business. There's a sympathetic signal going on in your body. Mm -hmm. Stress down, stress down digestion, increases cortisol and epinephrine. So I'm in a, I'm in a relaxed state. I'm in a parasympathetic state. I, a banana goes in my body. I'm in a rest and digest state. So my body it breaks it down. It absorbs. It assimilates the banana. You may it may sit in your stomach and become. Uh, gas, it may become putrefied, yeah. it may become inflammation, it may become all these other things, just because we're different people. Mm -hmm. So when, as a bodybuilder, you're so consumed with the numbers, right? Like, yeah, need more calories. calories. Yeah. Well, that's a problem, especially if some of those calories are contributing to your inflammatory load into the stress. Because right. you don't realize, like, you put something in your body that's toxic, it's causing inflammation, it's causing stress. If your body creates a stress response and causes, it creates an inflammatory response, 
So it's not just about macros, it's what your body does with those macros. Right. right? So eating 3,000 calories when you're stressed is never the same as eating 3,000 calories when you're not stressed. Right. So I think that was a huge mistake, and I think a lot of people make this mistake, is you know, macros are the only thing that matters. It's fucking stupid. It doesn't make any sense. And you start to learn more about biochemistry and physiology, and you're like, oh, but that can't make sense. If it's going into two different bodies, how could that possibly be right. sense? today versus tomorrow like if i'm calm today and i'm just laying on the beach like we all been on vacation eat whatever the hell we want come back leaner mm -hmm. like, why's that <laughs> why's that well, because uh. i'm eating six thousand calories a day maybe my metabolism kicked up no it's because your parasympathetic nervous system kicked up you're relaxed you got out of sympathetic drive now your body can actually use the nutrients you put wow. in, right right so and again you, i know you're fasting like fasting is a very good thing if you're not a massively sympathetic person, if you're mm -hmm. a massively sympathetic person, you're gonna get fatter. Like, wow. your body eating less, right? Because if you think about it, your body's gonna start, like, sympathetic is, is correlated with cortisol. So your body dumps out all your, your glycogen from your liver, mm -hmm. it's because it needs to use it for immediate fuel, and you keep burning through glycogen, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when you run into glycogen? You burn through muscle, mm -hmm. you don't burn through fat. So if you're, if, you're not, if you're not a healthy individual, fasting is not the best idea because your body just burns through muscle. So unless you're parasympathetic, Fasting is not a great idea. Although there's been some data that shows fasting is parasympathetic, mm -hmm. and it calms you down. So mm -hmm. if you're someone who's a massive amount of stress, fasting may not be a good idea. So short-term fasting is actually a mm -hmm. sympathetic stimulus. Like it's actually increasing the amount of adrenaline and cortisol. That's what we feel so good. Our brain feels good. Right. right? Gets us a little hyped up. Um, but it's not necessarily the best for people who already have that that base yeah. level. So Especially if someone's like really toxic too, because then the body has to. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of levels to it, man. So this idea of, of it of anything being including, including cannabis and, and fasting, like anything being a panacea, you have to be a little worried worrisome about that, a little, a little curious about like what environment is it going into in my body before I just assume it's gonna work for me. Right. Right. So it's so I, I saw recently that you're doing thirty days of carnivore. Is that true? I, I ended up doing about twenty three days of carnivore <laughs> nice. because I was in Dubai. It was very hard to eat carnivore and carnivore in Dubai. Like good quality meat is important. Um, so like you're traveling, you're in an airport, I'm like, fuck it. I just ended up eating like, I still eat well, but like didn't eat the full 30 days. Yeah. I actually felt really good. Um, carnivore was very, very interesting. Um, surprising to me. I'm very um, skeptical of everything. Yep. <laughs> but so I was very aware of like every day I'd make a, I'd make a, a roast with bones and I'd eat the, the bone marrow and I'd drink all the juice and like drink all the, the collagen and gelatin and such. And so making sure I was getting kind of entire um, you know, nose to tail. Yeah. Um, eat a lot of uh, organ meats and I feel really good, man. I think that's the problem because it's so uh, county cult countercultural, right? Like right. nobody eats bones, nobody eats liver, nobody eats heart, right? Like kidneys, nobody eats that stuff, and it's kind of weird for us. Uh, but if you do that, I feel like you're probably going to have a relatively well-rounded diet. Mm -hmm. And I call it for my kids. My son doesn't like to eat meat. I call it the warrior diet. Yeah. So what do warriors eat? They eat meat. You want to be a warrior or you want to be a peasant? Mm -hmm. like I was joking. I'm like, yeah. You, know, you, you want to just eat rice? Peasants eat corn and potatoes. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> they eat what's left over, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, what they can find. So, yeah, it's just <laughs> my crude way of teaching my kids how to eat. But, yeah, it works. Yeah, 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 man. So, uh, I, I feel great, dude. I felt great when I was doing it. And now my, my diet is not much different. It's just with a little added fats and some vegetables. So, a little more well rounded. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, man. Thanks, bro. Appreciate this time. Appreciate your expertise. My pleasure. And man. your thank presence. You. Thank you, brother. And we're going to actually. Uh, we're going to get on Ben's podcast right now. I'm going to reverse the roles. Yeah, so if yeah. you're watching, make sure that you click over. I'll put a link down below so that you can Muscle just Intelligence chime Podcast. In. Yeah, Let's cool. Do it. Done.